Thank you for being with us, Sheriff. How are you? I'm uh, really just passing it on to Sarah, but I just wanted to be here to support her and support our program, and also to thank each of you for our MAT medical assistant treatment program that you have supported thus far. And so we're only here to ask for an amendment. And so without further ado, we'll turn it over to Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. We do have slides. So we're thrilled to be here. It's been about a year and a half since we last presented. And the question becomes, how did we get here? As many know that Buncombe County was um, disproportionately impacted by the opioid crisis. I guess I'm in charge of this. <laughs> disproportionately impacted by the opioid crisis with deaths per capita. Um, this is in the state, but also within the nation. And interestingly, our prescribing of the medications which are known to be able to treat the opioid crisis, um, we prescribe at a lower rate in the lowest percentile within the state. So while we're higher, we have a higher impact, what we're doing to prescribe to treat is at a lower rate. Huh. So in 2018, or there was a, in 2018, a 15-year study was released on formerly, formerly incarcerated um, North Carolina inmates. And what that study demonstrated is that individuals leaving detention or leaving prison systems were at a 74 um, times higher likelihood of overdosing of heroin post-release. And within two week period, um, 40 times more likely to overdose from all the different types of opioids combined. So this is very, very alarming. This study led into our program here at the detention facility and we wanted to know what our death statistics and correlations were with our community deaths. And so in joint partnership with the Register of Deeds and Health and Human Services, we were able to draw all of our data together and analyze what that looked like here in our local community. And the findings were astounding. What we found, we started data from 29, or 2016, 2017, 2018, so we had uh, three years initially. And we found that over 50% of everyone who was dying in the county at one point was passing through our building through the detention center. And of those persons that were dying and passing through, over 50% were leaving within a 24 hour rate. And so that told us that our window to intercept and provide services was very, very small. And then shockingly, over 50% of the people who were coming through our building and dying were dying within one year. And so now we have a number of years worth of data. We have four full years. Um, 2020 is incomplete. We're still waiting for the fourth quarter to come back. And we haven't yet gotten the data from 2021. But on that four-year average, what we see um, is an average of 92 deaths a year in our county. So if we break it down, 57% of those individuals who passed had moved through detention at one point in time. 61% of those individuals on a four-year average were only there for 24 hours. And you can see the one-year statistic through the four-year average, over 62% had died within one year. So that's astronomical. That, that data really told us that our detention facility is a crossroads to be able to um, work with people who are most at risk and provide some life-saving measures and treatment. Also in 2018, the National Sheriff's Association released a publication of the value of MAT in jail and detention facilities. They acknowledge that these buildings really are um, the epicenter to be able to confront and treat people with best practice, gold standard, proven methods, right, that treat the addiction. And so here we are, the Strategic Community Opioid Response Team. We launched it. That's a photo of our very first team there, minus Sheriff Miller with his t-shirt. Um, but the goals, number one, we wanted to impact the overdoses, right? See what we could do to support the reduction of overdoses in our community. Impact jail, um, our jail population and lower recidivism. Provide these life stabilizing treatment interventions, as well as utilize the 21st century policing strategies, which one of those is data driven practices. So this entire program has been launched and built off of these data components that we've been able to, to gather. So some significant milestones in our programming. We're screening everybody who comes into the building. Number one, when somebody's walking through the door, we're asking them if they are an opioid user. And what that does is it triggers a resource sheet handed to them and also um, prepares them with the overdose reversal kit when they leave the building. We're also screening individuals at the medical intake 
um, juncture, which is about at the four hour mark. So if somebody's coming in, we're using that opportunity within the first four hours of them being there to educate them on what treatment resources are available to them, both while they're detained, but also once they hit the community. Introducing individuals to what MAT is, it was shocking how few people actually understand medication-assisted treatment. Individuals who are actively um, using opioids have never heard of it. A lot of professionals in the treatment world have never heard of it, so a lot of education. Um, education, again, to the recipients, potential participants of our program, education to the providers, education to our own staff. We do opioid reversal kits um, provided to every individual who reports opioid use in the building. That's a significant um, service that we do, and that's been in partnership with the health department as well. We have reentry supports looking to connect people with um, the resources that they need to stabilize life, everything from housing to employment, um, recovery, community, anything that's going to help folks move forward in their life as well as peer support services, and that is up to one year after their release. Now, peer support, if you haven't heard of it, it's an individual who has lived experience. So our peer, um, Samantha Brawley, she is one of the most inspiring humans I've met. She has worked in and out of um, her own addiction, found stable long-term recovery, and she speaks to our participants very candidly on the journey. Um, so we have a number of peers that work with us in partnership on the re-entry side, and then again, a peer nested in the medical center with our, with our program. So some quick numbers there in regards to the person served. Um, we, pre-COVID, would see about 120 opioid users come in and out of the building and make the medical intake junctures. So that does, did not account for the individuals that were just walking through and released after they got their charges. So anybody who was staying for any length of time, about 120 per month. When COVID hit, that number went down to about 80 to 90 per month. So our volume is very, very high. Even across the state, our numbers are much higher than our other counties. We're providing case management to folks as um, able. This program was unfolded in phases. So phase one really focused on data collection. Phase two, we were able to hire a case manager and a peer. So they started screening folks and providing that case management at that time. We do serve a number of pregnant women. Some come in already on the medication. Others, we introduce them to the medication as well. And then we've been able to introduce a number of new patients to the medication itself. So as they step out, they are better equipped and more prepared to, to work through the recovery process. And then training our staff as well and providing Narcan to our staff. That's, that's a large part of our service. There have been some significant challenges. Obviously, COVID set us back a little bit, um, but we've been able to figure out how we could launch anyways during that time, which has been really exciting. And then there's a lot of stigma that is associated with addiction, with recovery, both internally of individuals who actively use drugs. There's actually stigma with them about um, using a medication to help them work through recovery. So providing education to that population, to our own population, the law enforcement community has got a lot of stigma, right, that we have to work through. Um, and even in the recovery community, um, professionals that are providing recovery services, there's even stigma there. So those are some of the big barriers that we're really starting to focus on now here in 2021. Some really um, precious pieces of data have come out of this program. And it's important to note that the, the data is, we have these very small data sets, right? So as we gather data, we try to interpret it as accurately as possible for the, the bits that we have and then apply it so we can have a functioning program. But comparing the death statistics from 2019 to 2020, what we saw was a 15% decrease, and that is comparing detention deaths to the community deaths. So the number of deaths that we had in the community um, that number came down 15% between 2020 and 2015. Now, it's hard to interpret that. The whys behind that, we did enter into COVID, so we don't have enough time to be able to do a solid analysis, but that number went in the right direction. We were very pleased to see that. One year of um, data showed that our individuals who are on MAT when they come into the building have an average length of stay of three days. And this is really significant on a number of levels because the average length of stay overall is 18 days. So this number here tells us that individuals who are on that treatment already and do get arrested are leaving at a much faster rate than the average population. So this has a lot of optimism regarding jail population and keeping our numbers in check. 
Sir? Why might that be? Tell me more. Yeah, so when somebody's on the medication, typically they've got more stability factors in their life, right? They're working through addiction, um, and, and so their, their addiction likely is not driving crime that's, that's leading towards arrest. They've got typically housing. They typically have jobs that are enabling them to pay for their medication. Overall, there's more stability factors than an untreated um, person who uses drugs. They might be able to bond out more likely as well, Since rather mm -hmm. than sitting in jail because they can't afford a five hundred dollar, a thousand dollar. Yep, that's one a piece. E one example. Yep, that's one example. The risk assessments that pretrial use are asking about jobs, um, stability of housing. Those factors lend into the judge's determinations on release. Mm -hmm. Prior to uh, launching into our next phase of starting new patients on medications. We were looking at our volume at this point. We were in the middle of COVID, and so we had to determine, do we have the capacity within the building with the restrictions that we're operating under for safety to introduce a new population and more of a workflow? And so what, what arose from that data analysis was individuals who were already on MAT recidivated at a rate of about 12% while untreated opioid users were recidivating at a 30% rate. Now this is also a really interesting number. This is only nine months of data. And at this time, when we analyzed this data, we were only counting people who were on the medication. We weren't actually continuing it. And so these people were not act getting active services. This is just a raw count, no services rendered. What's the number telling us? And so with, with very limited outreach, we saw that 17% decrease um, in recidivism. So that was very exciting. So where are we, are, where are we today? Program, program movement, um, working to refine the current services that we have in the building, and also continuing to evolve according to our population needs and the feedback that we're, we're receiving. One really exciting um, extension of our programming is the community advisory panel. This is a group of about 10 individuals in the community who have a history of arrest, active addiction, having been in and out of the different types of treatment and recovery programs that communities offer, and they provide active feedback to us of what it was like to go through detention, to go through detox, um, and they, they give us very relevant feedback that has actually impacted and influenced the direction that our program has gone, and we've made changes accordingly. So this is a really powerful component of our program. We have a lot of active collaboration and some new collaborations that are getting ready to launch, some exciting ones with the child support divisions and pretrial as well. We're, we're super thrilled to see how that continues to unfold in the months to come. And then a number of cross-disciplinary partnerships. We've um, worked very closely with the health department over these past number of months, um, starting to work with the uh, post-overdose response team, the community paramedicine team, creating workflows, how can we support each other's work and really tighten the communication for the benefit of our community because our populations do overlap. And then some um, exciting things on the forefront in regards to our program evaluations, figuring out how can we continue to, to analyze this data in a way that's accurate and constructive for future evaluations. So again, 2021, we're really focusing on those death numbers. How can we bring down the correlation of people leaving detention who are dying in the community because this is where we have that impact. Increasing our training, both within the, the recipients of our programming, um, educating them where they can access those resources, how they can effectively connect with the resources that are available to them, training our own staff, training medical, and working with the community as well. The partnerships are very, very important. This is a strategic community opioid response program because we understand that within the detention facility, if we just operate as a silo, then our success rates are gonna be much, much lower than if we strengthen our relationships and our, our continuity within the community. And then effectively linking our participants to this medication and other, um, other resources that help them do well in life. So we were identified by the state as a recipient of this grant. Um, we're in our second year of funding at this point, and we do anticipate a third year of funding. It's been $283,000, which has been split with our partners in programming. So a lot of folks ask, how does programming actually enter into the jail for a person-specific 
um, approach. So this is more of a general overview, less specific to the MAP program. So if a person is wanting to provide services to one of their clients, it typically comes through one of two portals. It will either come through our re-entry case management or our, our diversion team, or it will come through our medical contractor. And so those two teams will receive those referrals. They are brilliant about teasing out and identifying who the best reentry resource is going to be, and they filter those um, those clients, those needs down into the reentry portal. So it's a really unified work. Um, those two teams work really close together, have great communication, very effective in their work. And then lastly, um, this diagram is just a spoken wheel model of how our team receives the the. Um, has the, the various clients, and then they refer them out to the respective appropriate uh, resource in the community. We've got a lot of partners. Buncombe County is a wonderful place. Everyone is here because we want to be here and does great work and especially working together. So again, a lot of collaboration with Health and Human Services, the Justice Department, a lot of collaboration there. We've got a number of private sector partners that we work closely with, and then the new budding EMS teams. So as you can see, our goals, they align really well with the 2025 strategic plan of Buncombe County, right? Lowering the overdoses in our community, working on that jail population and the recidivism, um, helping folks stabilize their lives so they can live well. And then again, incorporating the 21st century policing. This is a photo of our, um, our peer, Samantha, on the left, uh, for, on the right side, but closest on the left, and then uh, Miss Felicia, our nurse, and they're doing an orientation for our new employees, which has been a new strategy that we've been implementing for all of our new staff, really effective. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the mic to Dr. Gowen. He's got a brilliant way of breaking down information, so if you have any questions, please ask. Um, and without further ado. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Tracy Gowen. I'm the medical director at Buncombe County Detention Facility, uh, as well as at Swain Recovery Center out in Black Mountain and the Women's Recovery Center here in Asheville. Uh, I'm an addiction medicine specialist. I've been in practice for about 25 years, the most recent 14 back here in the United States. And I got involved in the medical work at Buncombe County because of Sarah and the team there. I was fortunate enough to be asked to help initiate this MAT treatment program. And it's, it, it occurred to me when Sarah and I were talking about getting up here sharing my experiences, I realized that treating opiate use disorder patients at Buncombe County is similar to practicing medicine in a bush hospital in the Nigerian jungle, which I did for 10 years. They're similar in these ways. They are the two places where I have seen the most impact made and where I have seen the greatest potential for change, not only in individuals, but for the society. They are also the two most fulfilling professional experiences I have, I've ever had. And lastly, they are the two locations, the only two locations where I've seen practicing medicine, where I have seen grown men and women break down in tears when they are offered help and a treatment that can save their lives and change their lives for the better. So I, see, I have seen a lot of correlations there. And now most of our patients, as you can imagine, they're pretty calloused from years of being stigmatized. They're hardened from a life of revolving in and out of prison and jails because they have a disease, a treatable disease that has been proven by medical research and science repeatedly over the last decade or two. And MAT is proven to be the key component, a key component in that treatment. And the Sheriff's Office has put together an incredible team, as Sarah showed you, to treat these individuals with opiate use disorder. And it's been a blessing to see even some of the early results. Uh, when we explain to them that they're not weak-willed moral degenerates, that societal stigmat stigmatization has told them, you can see a little spark of hope in their eyes. And then we educate them. We educate them that they have a genetically based brain disease. You see a little bit more interest. Wall comes down, they wanna hear more. We explain to them 
that their reward system is faulty. So their natural morphine, their endorphins, is and or the receptors where those endorphins bind is faulty. So substances, when they take substances, they have a different experience than the majority of the population. And it's because of a genetically based difference either in those endorphins, the natural morphine, or the morphine receptors or the opioid receptors. So these people typically have gone through life with a dis-ease, a baseline anhedonia, uncomfortable in their own skin. And the first time they take an exogenous opiate, man, the lights come on. This is it. They feel right. Now, the beauty of buprenorphine, the medication we use in MAT, is it binds those mu opioid receptors. And when it does, it activates the receptor. People feel normal. There's no craving. There's no withdrawal. And they're not impaired. They are actually very, very functional. The other advantage of this is that it has a strong binding affinity. It binds that receptor. It binds it strongly has a long, uh, long half-life, it stays on there a long time. So even if they go out and they decide they're going to use, they're going to figure out real quickly, even though we tell them, they're not going to feel it. Because it, it has such a strong binding affinity, it'll kick heroin off of a receptor. You could actually use it almost like Narcan, essentially, if you had to. But it's a whole different topic. So as we share these facts with these patients, you can actually see their humanity begin to shine through that thick veneer of shame and guilt that has been laid down by years of stigmatization, demonization, and marginalization. They start to feel like they're back part of the community. You see a little bit of glint in their eyes, usually through tears, has been my experience sharing with them there in the jail. Um, and you can see a little bit of the fear begin to dissipate. Because nearly every patient that I've had at Buncombe County has admitted to me that they know the minute their foot hits that pavement outside the jail, they're going to want to use. And they also admit to me that no one has ever offered them help to deal with that desire. So now we do. So MAT provides them a sense of security that as they step back out into the world, they know they have a medication that's going to prevent them from craving drugs, and they know now they have a team behind them that has already arranged the continuity of care for them. I've actually been fortunate enough to see a few of the people come out of Buncombe County and show up over at Swain Recovery Center or the Women's Recovery Center as they have progressed and taken the ne next step in their recovery, and they are full of gratitude and hope. So I'm here just mostly tonight to thank you. Thank you for supporting this program that is changing lives, it's saving lives, and it's bettering our community. So thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer any of those as far as how the medication works or. Okay, thank you so much. No, thank you. Uh, commissioners, are there any questions? Or is there a motion to approve the budget amendment and extend the one year grant funded position as long as the grant funding is available? I'd like to make a motion to accept the grant funding and extend the position as long as the funding is available. And just, if I could, just additionally, just to say a tremendous thank you to Sheriff Miller, to Ms. Gayton, to Doctor for sharing the work you've been doing, but really just the substance of that work. It's mm -hmm. pretty extraordinary to see what you've built in this time. Um, and I uh, know how much hard work it's taken and it's, very powerful and inspiring to see the ways it's it's impacting people's lives in our community. So thank you all for your leadership yeah. and not just kind of following a formula, but really doing the extra work to figure out how to create a Buncombe model that I think is um, helping the people of Buncombe County. Um, so just an aside with the, with the motion on the floor. I'll second. Great. Further discussion? Yeah, I would just also echo, it's a tremendous amount of progress and accomplishment. So thank you all for your very innovative and important work. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Yeah.